welcome back everyone. Um, we will do a quick microarray example. So I told you about microarrays and microarrays are one of these major inventions that actually forced bioinformatics to a new level. Don't forget, now I already started recording. I said that when I was muted, so no, nope. sorry. <laughs> Okay, so um, microarrays are a tool and they are one of the main tools nowadays um, for uh, analysis of gene expression. Uh, we also have like RNA sequencing nowadays, but microarrays are still still very useful and they kind of highlight... Um, oh, you were watching a commercial due to a page refresh. Yeah, yeah, I don't like the commercials, but like it's it, like... Yeah, yeah. I can't really do anything about it. Twitch needs to make money as well, although they're owned by Amazon, so they have more than enough money, you would think, but um, they kind of don't. So, um, And the nice thing is, is you're watching commercials, so that means that you are not the product. So on Zoom, which is free, more or less, right? You are the product. So anything that you say on, on platforms like Zoom, um, they they record that even though they say they don't and but they i don't trust zoom at all it's from chinese origin so <laughs> anyway so that's why i do it on twitch um so um gene expression and microarrays let's get back into the flow of the lecture um microarrays can measure the expression level of more than twenty thousand genes in a single experiment and that is a major advantage like in the 1990s beginning of the 1990s we could only measure like five or ten genes at the same time um, and when I started doing my PhD microarrays were miniaturized already a lot um, but they were um, they were they were they were shaky and nowadays microarrays are really really good so there's two types of microarrays. We have one color microarrays versus two color microarrays. So one color microarrays allow you to measure a single sample um, and two color microarrays are generally used in kind of a case control experiment. Um, so you put normal tissue on there and for example cancer tissue and then the microarray um, with the color shows you which gene is highly expressed in the one and lowly expressed in the other one. So how does how does this work? So we use a fluorescent dye, um, Psi3 and or Psi5, depending if you have a one or two color microarray, and then we have a signal intensity. So the intensity of the of the of the dye is read out by a scanner. So a little bit of a of an overview on how this worked. So we have um, uh, the annotated genomic structure, right? So we have, for example, the human genome with its twenty thousand genes. Um, so the first thing that we do is decide which parts of the genome we want to measure the activity on. Um, so to do that, we make uh, something which is called PCR products. So we amplify probes. So we define the regions that we want to target. These regions are then using PCR, we take out these regions from the genome and put them on these little glass plates. Then we have two samples, for example, normal lung tissue and uh, lung cancer tissue. Um, and then we extract the RNA from this. Um, we color the RNA using uh, Psi3 or Psi5. Um, and then we take both of the samples, we mix them together and we put them on the microarray. There's then a laser, which are, uh, are actually two lasers. So one measures the red channel, the other one measures the green channel. Um, and in the end, we get raw images of each of the channels, which are then using computer science or more or less tools put together to create the overview of a microarray picture. So the microarray here, if a dot is green, it was highly expressed in sample one. If a dot is red, then the, the gene was highly expressed in sample two. If it is yellow, then it's not interesting because there was no difference between the two samples. And if it's black, that means that the gene or the probe was not expressed in any of the samples, in, in, any, uh, in any of the two. So that's kind of how a microarray works. So we, we define which areas of the genome we want to measure. Uh, we then take out parts of the genome using PCR and then put them on little glass plates. We then put our samples on. So I always say that microarrays are kind of a fishing experiment um, because hey you're kind of fishing uh, with little DNA probes to see uh, which sample has which genes that are expressed. So the workflow 
for a uh, microarray is more or less the following and all of the bold parts are parts where bioinformatics is involved right so the first part is to create these oligo arrays so to create these arrays with these little DNA probes on there a, a DNA probe is also called an oligo um, and of course there you need a bioinformatician to take the whole genome sequence, figure out where the genes are, and then hit, cut them up um, and make a microarray. Um, so even nowadays, custom microarrays still need to be made. Um, we recently did an experiment, and in that experiment we did mice on microarrays, and we were really interested in a region on chromosome 3. So the commercially available microarrays did not have as many probes there as we wanted. So the thing that we did is we kind of saturated our region of interest with, with hundreds and hundreds of additional probes. And of course, when you put more probes in one region, you have to remove them from the other one. So it's always a... Um, there's always a, a cost benefit analysis, right? Because we're interested only in this region, so we saturate the region with probes. Of course, the acquiring of samples is generally done either in a mouse house or in a, in a greenhouse. Um, has, so that's where people, uh, biologists work. They, they do their experiment and then they extract their samples. Um, they extract and label the DNA from the samples that they collected. Um, this is then hybridized to one of these microarrays that were designed. And then, of course, scanning occurs. And already at the scanning point, Bioinformatics starts becoming more important because you need to know how the dyes are reacting to the different lasers. So there's a there's kind of a and not all dyes have the same dynamic range. And so also there, bioinformatics is already involved in how to build better scanners and miniaturize it even more. Of course, after you've scanned these microarrays, um, there's a lot of data that comes from it, right? If you're measuring a, a, a because the machine just takes kind of a picture and this picture is stored in kind of a TIFF format um, but these pictures are huge because these dots are tiny um, so hey you have images um, which generally are like uh, 5 million pixels by 5 million pixels which generates images in the order of like 100 to 200 MBs um, so and this data needs to be stored somewhere because of course you, you have to do something with the data later on and you want to keep it for later as well. Um, the next step is, of course, data normalization. So data normalization is something that we will talk about more. But also there, of course, statistics is used to kind of get rid of unwanted variation. Um, for example, there's a little air bubble on one of the microarrays or there's a hair that, that got into the machine. Um, the next step generally after data normalization is to do gene expression clustering because we're measuring 20,000 genes, right? Um, we're not interested in a single gene, but we want to see if, for example, a whole pathway of genes comes up, right? If you think about plants, um, we might be interested in the glucosinolate pathway. Um, if you think about mice, we might be interested in, for example, the glucose pathway in the liver, or if it's some pathway in the brain um, that is that is highly expressed in people with Alzheimer's versus lowly expressed in, in people that don't have that. And then, of course, the next step is data interpretation, and there bioinformatics is responsible for searching through all of the available literature using automated literature scanning um, to see if we can kind of interpret our data and, and see how our data fits into all available knowledge that people have collected in the last dozens of years. So. Just a step by step going through, so uh, creating the arrays, a bioinformatician determines which sequence are measured. So humans have around 25,000 genes, um, a little bit more than was determined in the Human Genome Project, because we know now that there's also things like genes that do not code for protein, but code for things like microRNAs or um, other types of, of, of RNAs which are biologically active. Um, each gene in the human genome is like 10,000 to 15,000 base pairs long. And so if you multiply these numbers together, hey, you get an, an idea of the amount of base pairs that we could measure. But we only have probes which are like 20 to 40 base pairs long. So we definitely have to make a 
decision on what we want to measure and what we can't measure because we can't measure everything even though microarrays are really good um, they still have a limit so there's around 5 million probes that you can put on but 5 million times 40 is not the same as uh, 25,000 times 15,000 right so we do have to make a decision on what goes on there so using bioinformatics we design these probes and we estimate the performance of these probes beforehand because not every probe will work because of um, temperature sensitivity or like too many A's and too little C's so the binding is not good enough and so this this estimation of the performance is something that a bioinformatician does um, together with the design of the probes so after the microarrays are scanned, which is kind of what we get here, so this is a, a real picture of a two-color microarray, and this picture is is really really huge. Like it's 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 tens of thousands of pixels by tens of thousands of pixels, if it not a couple of million. Um, and but if you zoom in on a two-color microarray, you see um, that there are very very tiny dots, and each of these dots have a certain color. Right, I told you that green is high in one sample, red is high in the other, um, and here we see kind of a, a one color microarray. So that just has green, and then the green intensity, the more intense, the more a gene was expressed, um, and you, you don't get any information on, uh, it's, not a, it's not a sample one versus sample two. Um, but hem microarrays are scanned and then of course we get these pictures and these pictures then need to be converted into intensity values because like we can't just use the picture we have to have a, a matrix with numbers um, so how does that how, how do we do that well we go from this picture using several software tools into something which is called kind of the gene expression matrix so generally on the rows you have the different genes and then on the on the different columns you have the different samples and in the middle you have the gene expression level so generally this fits in excel uh, depending on how many samples you have um, like 10 years ago excel only allowed to have like 16,000 rows um, and that was always an issue so you couldn't use Excel so you had to find a different format uh, and generally these are big comma separated files um, which just for every gene and for every sample have the gene expression level um, in, in a certain range right so the next step then is to normalize and why do we need to normalize this data because if microarrays are so good why are they not perfect well there's always some kind of non-biological variation per samples right um, one sample we just pipe it or one microarray we just pipe it a little bit of more RNA on the whole microarray compared to the other one right you, you can pipe it exactly 10 nanograms of, of RNA um, sometimes you pipe it 10,1 sometimes you pipe it 9,8 right so this little variance in the total amount which is put on needs to be normalized away there's also the problem that there's a different dynamic range of different scanners so we can't just use two different machines and then expect the results from the first machine to exactly match the results of the second machine and of course if you're if you're doing gene expression on like 300 or 500 individuals then not all individuals are scanned on the exact same machine and on the exact same day right because also these machines are uh, sensitive to things like environmental temperature if the temperature goes up by two degrees celsius it changes the ability of dna to bind with other dna um, so had a temperature but also the humidity has a massive influence on the intensity of the arrays and all of these effects um, are something that we are not interested in we are interested in which gene is different in cancer tissue versus normal tissue. We're not interested in like how the temperature of the room affects our results. Um, and so there's many different algorithms that exist to normalize microarray data. And we'll be getting to that in later lectures. So in later lectures, we will be talking more in detail about microarrays and, and which tools and which uh, algorithms there are to, to analyze this type of data and to normalize away non-biological variants. And of course, this also has a risk right there's also the risk that we throw away real biological variation by normalizing so we will have an example of that and um, you guys can then in R do your own kind of analysis on a little bit of microarray data 
The next step is uh, gene expression clustering. Like I told you, the microarrays has 5 million probes and they measure like more than 10,000 genes. And we want to focus on the main result because we can't just say, well, there's this gene which kind of follows this. No, there's a holistic approach, right? So we, we need to take into account all of the genes of the microarray. And then we need a way to visualize this data. We can't make um, 10,000 box plots and look at the box plot of gene one and then see, oh, it's different in our sample and our control and then look at the second box plot. Right, so the most common strategy here is to visualize the most differentially expressed genes. Um, but this is difficult when you have a lot of different groups that you are dealing with. Yeah, so we might have not just a case control study, um, but we might have like uh, 10 varieties of, of grain. And all of these varieties of grain, they have a very similar genome. Yeah, but of course, all of these 10 varieties have their own unique gene expression patterns. And of course, we want to visualize this and we want to show the biologist, yes, you did this experiment and the high yielding grain um, has this gene which is generally expressed higher or has this cluster of genes which expressed together um, seems to increase the yield of the, uh, of the, uh, of the plant. Um, and of course we use again algorithms to create these groups and cluster data together. Um, so and that's the common strategy is not to focus on a single thing um, like you do with qPCR, um, but really to look at all of the genes in the genome and then figure out, well, this group of genes is probably the group of genes that I have to have a closer look at. So how does this look? Well, I gave you a couple of uh, or two examples. Um, so one is a clustering of genes where we look at immune cells. Um, the sort of paper where it comes from is, is uh, located here. Um, so we see we have uh, CD20 minus cells. So those are cells which are not expressing CD20. And then we have CD20 high cells. So those are cells which are expressing a certain surface marker on their um, outside of the, of the cell wall. Uh, we have different samples, right? So here we have five, five samples measured with the CD20 and we have like five samples that have uh, uh, that do not have and that have. Um, and then we can see here in the rows, um, the names are not here, but each of these rows, and there, there are literally thousands of rows, we can see that some genes are expressed lowly in CD20 cells, other genes are expressed highly in CD20 cells, and the opposite here. And we always focus on differences, right? Because if a gene is expressed highly in both cell types, it's probably not interesting. But if, if it's high in one, low in the other one, then we can think like, oh, there might be something going on there. We can also do something different, right? And that, that means we can calculate correlation. So I assume that most people know how correlation works. Um, but here, for example, we look at different tissues. So and in, this, in this research here, this uh, is the preprint. Um, and um, what I show or what they show is indeed that if you look, for example, at brain tissue, I hope it's readable. It's a little bit small, but I can just read it. But if you look at brain tissue, you see that it doesn't really matter where you take your brain tissue from. Um, if you take a vector of measurements from, uh, for example, hypothalamus, then of course the vector of, of genes in the amygdala are very highly correlated. But you can see very clearly that brain tissue has a very different gene expression pattern uh, compared to, for example, things like skin or the different arteries. And, and so correlation also helps us to more or less group these things into, into data. And it allows uh, correlation in this case allows you to look across different tissues and figure out what is unique to these tissues and if there are any tissues which are very similar. And so for example here we can see that actually in the uh, pituitary gland uh, that these samples are again more like brain tissue and not so much like for example testis or cells uh, that were taken from uh, lymphocytes. So hey, different ways of visualization and this is what what a bioinformation does, right? We, we get big matrices filled with intensity values and then we visualize it in a way that people can understand, oh, all of the genes in uh, CD20 cells that don't express are all the genes in CD20 negative cells, hey, all these genes have, for example, something in common. 
and that is the next step because the next step would then be to see if there's any pathways that are overrepresented in this data. So gene expression, there's many, many different ways on how to cluster gene expression. So you can use different partitioning methods like hierarchical clustering or fuzzy clustering or density based. Yeah, but all of these measurements depend on having a certain distance measurement because we have to define which samples look similar and which samples are different. And this is not an easy thing to define uh, because have what is different and what is similar is of course very dependent on how you think about differences. But all of these things can be caught mathematically in something which is called a distance measurement. And during next lectures we will talk about different m distance measurements that people came up with like Euclidean distance, Manhattan distance, Minowski distance. So hey, there's different distances and all of these distances give you a score for how similar two things are or how different two things are and then you can use these differences and similarities to kind of cluster them together in trees uh, using using a kind of tree visualization. Of course, we also use a lot of statistics because we need to determine which effects are significant, right? And significance is something that we have rules about. So we generally take like, hey, we want to have at least a false discovery rate of 5%, meaning that if um, we claim that these 100 genes are different between the two samples, hey, we kind of agree that, well, not all 100 are probably different, but 95 out of 100 definitely are, right? So Significance in a statistical sense means that the likelihood that the differences are observed are real is high enough for us to trust the results. And of course this comes back with the fact that we're testing tens of thousands of genes and so there we have to account for things like multiple testing. And we'll go into much more detail uh, in the microRLA lecture to kind of show you guys uh, how you can more or less um, still have these significant effects um, even though you might have a very low amount of samples and you might have measured like hundreds and hundreds of different genes. So the data interpretation generally occurs via something called gene ontology. Um, so gene ontology is kind of the Tower of Babel in, in biology. Um, it is an up-to-date comprehensive computational model of biological systems um, which defines molecular levels larger than pathways like cellular and organism levels. So uh, we will be talking a lot about gene ontology. I'm not the biggest fan on gene ontology but the thing that it does is that it provides you with a structured vocabulary so that you can talk to each other. Right? We, we, in the past we used to have like five names for the same gene. Um, but hey, not only that, but someone talking about the insulin pathway. Um, hey, of course, what is the insulin pathway? Which genes belong to this pathway? This is something that gene ontology defines for us. So it is, it is a structured way so that using a computer you can see if a certain pathway is overrepresented or underrepresented in the genes that you found differentially expressed. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's the handiness of gene ontology is that it, it's a structured vocabulary. So instead of just having words which are defined by the context, it are, it's words that are defined by an ontology um, which is something that a computer can understand and reason about. So how does gene ontology look? Well, gene ontology is a tree, right? So we have, for example, the gene ontology, which is the biological process ontology. The biological process ontology is split into two different categories, right? So all of the genes are in here. So all of the genes are involved in some kind of a biological process. But some genes are involved in, for example, cellular processes, while other genes are involved in responses to stimuli. Of course, if you think about responses to stimuli, these can be responses to like endogenous stimuli. So endogenous means from within the cell, but it can also be responses to stress. Right? The same thing for cellular processes. Cellular processes can be cell communication, so one cell talking to another cell, but it can also be cellular physiological processes. So processes which happen within a cell which have nothing to do with cell-to-cell -cell communication. 
And hey, all of these genes, hey, so if you belong to a cellular process, you also belong to a biological, right? you're also a biological process, but it's a tree, right? So we, we, for each gene, we have assigned this gene to one of these category. Um, all right, that's one of the annoying things. So let's do ban. Where's the ban hammer? Ban. All right. Yeah. First one. Want to become famous? No, I don't want to become famous. I just want to do my lecture. Oh, my moderator was 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 quicker. All right. So hey, gene ontology structured vocabulary allows us to talk about things which might have been defined differently in the past. Um, I, I, it sees that one message was deleted by moderator just when I click the button to delete the message. Um, but I did the ban, so that's good. Um, and so, but and gene ontology, really, really useful. Hmm, interesting. By a moderator, but not you. I only have one moderator as far as I know. Or did Daniel become a moderator again? And is he sneakily watching the lecture as well? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, we will be talking more about gene ontology, but hey, remember gene ontology is a tree and it allows a computer to reason about concepts like um, cell death, um, what is transcription, hey, uh, what is dependent transcription or regulation of transcription. All right, so very small example. So bioinformatics is involved in the design of the oligonucleotide is involved in the design of the oligonucleotides that go onto the array, so the array probes. Um, bioinformatics is involved in normalization of expression data, um, clustering of data, creating visualizations, interpreting the results, and also storage and management, right? And that's what people often forget is that a big part of a bioinformatician is to kind of keep all the gigabytes or terabytes which are generated within a group of people um, working together on a single bio uh, on a single project or on a single biological entity had to to kind of keep that data hey it, it happens a lot that the professor comes in and well you know this experiment that we did like 15 years ago um, how does the new data that we have relate to that data right and then you have to be able to go to your computer, fish out the data from 15 years ago, and of course you have to do this in a reasonable amount of time. You can't say, yeah, come back in a week and I will have sorted the data for you. So had the, the management and the storage um, is a big part in, in bioinformatics as well. Of course, programming is essential. And like I told you guys, the course will not teach you to program. And unless everyone wants that. Right? We can have a poll on Moodle and everyone says, well, I want to learn how to program, um, but um, just go to my YouTube channel and um, watch the lecture that I did on programming in R. Um, so I did a whole programming courses and we will use some R's for some basic analysis. Um, and of course, when we will have assignments where it is required that you program, um, of course, these parts will be introduced. Um, hey, but the focus of the course is to get you to know which databases are there, which hold the data, things like Genbank and Ensemble. Hey, so where can I find my data, but also to kind of give you an idea of which tools are out there. Because as a bioinformatician, you can program everything that you want from scratch, right? So you, you have to use tools developed by other people. So the homework for today is uh, for you guys is to kind of prepare your computer that you will be doing the course on um, and things like, hey, you need to install at least a good text editor, um, install the R programming language because all of the assignments will be related to R, um, but also to install the uh, Git version control software um, and create a GitHub account and link your local computer to your own GitHub account um, so that you can collaborate and with other people. Because we will be doing some assignments where it will be kind of group assignments. Um, so and that for that, um, and people can work together. Um, and I'm actually a big fan of that. Like it, when I do computer programming courses, I don't think it makes sense for one person sitting behind a computer and trying to come up with an answer, it's much better to have like two or three people looking at the same problem and coming up with different strategies and discussing these and then 
together implementing it. I'm a big fan of kind of peer programming where people sit together behind a computer and uh, figure out the best way of doing something. Um, because one person is just an island and hey, you, you can't be an island. You're always collaborating with other people and the same thing holds for people who program. So um, Git is more or less the most common version control system. It was developed by um, the guy who also wrote the Linux kernel. So if you've ever installed the Linux operating system, you use this software. Um, but Git is, is made by him. Um, GitHub is a collaborative platform, so it's it one of the biggest, and I use it. And there's other other uh, providers of these things as well. Uh, the nice thing about GitHub is is that since you guys are part of the university and your students, you can get a free pro account, which is always nice that you can get something from free. Um, so the homework for today we will be doing after this uh, session and we will just take an hour and hey, I will guide you to where um, are the uh, where can you download the, the, the text editor, the, the R software, Git and these kinds of things. And we will be going through the steps needed to link your GitHub account to your local computer so that you can send data or code from your computer to an online source and then online work together with other people to generate a solution. All right, so the coming lectures. Um, Introduction to bioinformatics, that's the lecture what we did today, right? So we did the course overview, I give you a little bit of history, some definitions, why do we need bioinformatics? I, I hope I convinced you by now that bioinformatics is essential in modern day biology. Um, some examples, well I gave you one example on, on microarray data. Um, so the next lecture will be all about phenotypes or trades as people call them. Um, so we will be talking about Mendelian traits, about qualitative and quantitative traits, about statistical analysis, multiple testing, sample size and project planning. Um, had to get you guys familiar with everything surrounding phenotypes. And then we will be just going up the level um, that I showed you. Right? I showed you the arrow with the different biomolecular levels. Um, so the first level that we will be discussing is DNA. So there will again be a little bit of history about DNA and who, who did what, who invented what. Um, we will be talking about different sequencing techniques for, uh, for DNA. Um, we will be talking about genes, like how is a gene structured, uh, what are transposons, also called jumping genes. Uh, we will be called, uh, let me take a sip. We will be talking also about regulatory elements. Um, so um, how is DNA expression regulated? And we will be, um, and I will be showing you some examples of other types of DNA, like mitochondrial DNA and chloroplast. So eh, if you're a plant biologist, then you need to know about chloroplast because they're ha they, they have their own DNA, um, which is separated from the genomic DNA. And of course, we will be talking a little bit about biomarkers. The next level is RNA. So there will be a whole lesson about RNA, about the history, about the different types of RNA, about RNA expression, expression analysis, again, RNA sequencing, uh, the structure of RNA, which is very important for the function. The next level is proteins. So the history of proteins, structure prediction, function prediction. How do we define which proteins belong together? What are phylogenetic trees? These things will come up in lecture number four, right? Um, so this is one, two, three, four, five. So flexion number five. Um, then we will be talking about the metabolome, so the metabolites, so everything that you either put into your body or that your body creates, which are not proteins, RNA or DNA. Um, and we will be talking about things like what are metabolites, what is mass spectrometry, how do we identify different metabolites, like hey, how does the police know that you've used some type of drugs, um, and we will be talking about different databases which contain um, reactions, right? So how does cocaine break down in the body? Well, there's several databases that can allow you to do that. Or, well, not the, the database doesn't allow you to break down cocaine, but it allows you to see how this chemical substance is transformed in, for example, the liver or the kidneys into something that is not harmful for the body. Um, we will be talking about CAG and Reactome, which are more or less the two greatest data or the two biggest databases. And we will also be talking about Cytoscape in this uh, lecture. 
Um, and then I think there is one lecture which is cancelled because of Christmas, which is good because everyone likes Christmas. Um, so, but there will be a holiday break. I think it will be after the metabolomes and pathway um, lecture. And then we will be talking again about phenotypes, right? Because then we we go full circle. We start at the highest level, so the phenotypes, the things that are interesting to us, like because that makes the money, right? The milk yield of a cow is the thing that we're really interested in. And then we dive through all of these levels to get back to the same level. Um, and then I want to talk to you guys about QTL mapping um, because that's what I did my PhD on. So my PhD is about high throughput methodologies for QTL and genome wide association studies. Um, so I'm kind of an expert on that. Um, I, I would call myself an expert. I know a little bit about QTL mapping and genome-wide associations. Um, so I just wanted to have one lecture to talk about that. Um, we will then switch to something primer. Uh, we will then switch to primer design. Um, primer design is actually a pretty interesting lecture um, because it is very applicable because in your master project, you are bound to have to measure a gene um, or something like that, right? Like in biology, we measure genes and proteins. Um, so knowing how you design primers and knowing the basis of, of, of uh, a polymerase chain reaction um, is good. Although it might be actually that all of the students that are following the course have already some experience with primer design. Um, so if that is the case, then do let me know because I, I think in the bachelor there's also a course which explains PCR and primer design. Although I always love talking about Kerry Moulis. Kerry Moulis is one of my favorite guys in biology um, because he's just like a, a very interesting character and when we have the lecture, I can I can talk more freely about Kerry Mullis and and his drug history and the fact that he thinks that the that polymerase chain reaction actually he claims that the method actually was given to him by aliens, and aliens look like multicolored ferrets. It, it's such an interesting figure. He got a Nobel Prize um, for his invention. Um, he's one of the smartest guys, but he's he's very very strange and and fun right so i i think that that makes biology interesting that you have all kinds of these figures of, of or all kinds of people who have their own kind of handicaps in a way and um but so i love talking about Kerry Mullis. so if everyone knows primer design we can skip the primer design lecture um if not then um, i get to talk about Kerry Mullis. um the next lecture will be databases. So how are databases organized? What features are there? What are important databases? And then we will also be talking about Biomart. So Biomart is a software tool for the R programming language, which allows you to connect your R session directly to Ensemble and directly pull data from the Ensemble database, which is really, really useful um, because then you don't have to go online to Ensemble.org and click download and um, because the computer can then automatically talk to the database. Um, and Biomart is, is, is a very smart tool. Um, we will then be talking about sequence analysis. Uh, we will be doing alignments, alignments and alignments. And we will be talking about things like homology. What are sequence motifs? Um, how do you find sequence motifs? Um, and, and what do they mean? Um, and then of course we will have gene expression analysis. So we will be talking a little bit about the experimental design, uh, the data organization and preparation, statistical analysis and visualization of differential expression results. So that's more or less the, the lecture about microarrays because we will be using microarrays as an example. Of course, gene expression can also be measured using qPCR or um, RNA sequencing nowadays. Um, so the, the lecture is focusing on microarrays because it's small enough for me to give you a data set um, because otherwise I would have to give you an RNA sec data set which is like 500 MB or something and, and no one wants to download that. Um, then the last couple of lectures will be the standards for bioinformatics and st uh, statistical analysis. So we will be talking about different types of files, different file structures, about naming conventions that are there, like how do I call my file names, headers and different variables. Um, we will also be talking about documentation and testing. Um, so hey, how do I write proper documentation for software that I developed? What 
types of documentation are there um, and testing of course is very important because if you develop new algorithms then you have to have a test suite right because you you, you have something which uh, is kind of a gold standard so we will be talking about that and then the last lecture that we have is about scientific literature mining and management so that is where um, you get taught on how you use uh, PubMed advanced search but also how you can more or less automatically churn to through like 40 years of, of biological data um, and I also have a part of the lecture which is about reference management software which I think is very useful for people that write a master thesis or um, write a bachelor thesis um, because you shouldn't do scientific citations uh, by hand you, you use a computer program, right? Why would you spend time formatting your citations um, if there's just software out there which can do that for you? And then, of course, we will have a couple of your own choice lectures. So if you have a data set or if you have something that you think is missing from this list um, and, for example, oh, I want to learn everything about machine learning um, in the context of, um, for example, the new... Um, Google algorithm for um, protein prediction, protein structure prediction, I think it's called deep protein or something, um, then we can do that. So if you have something that really interests you and you don't see it on the list, um, send me an email or just throw it in chat and I will make a list and we can vote on it on which course we want to do. Um, but it's, I always like having a little bit of free space for you guys to decide what you want. All right, so the next lectures, um, so we decided we will get the lectures from one to four instead of from two to five. Um, assignments are necessary to pass the exam. So I will, I will make sure that the lectures are around two hours, three hours when we do the assignments together. Um, but there will be questions on the exam about the assignments and the assignments are the useful part. Right? You can listen to me talk about databases and stuff, but if you don't go to the database and click on the links and see what's there, then you don't learn what's in there. Right? Then you just get a very global overview. Um, so the exam will contain questions about the lectures and the assignments. So I, I'm just a tip for me. I've, in the past, I've noticed that people who don't do the assignments generally don't pass the exam. There are exceptions to any rule, of course, but there is a direct correlation between the people that do the assignments and ask questions and the people that pass the exam. All right, any questions so far? About microarrays, other things, any people that already have a suggestion for a course that we, uh, we want to do? Um, then um, throw it in chat. Um, we will have. Um, uh, oh, I'm a little bit. Oh, I'm a little bit on time. So we will have like a 10, 15 minute break. So I will try and be back at like 4, 10, 4, 15, and then we will start getting your computer ready. So then we will start downloading some stuff, um, and we will go together and see. Uh, to see that everyone gets their Git installed and um, everyone gets their. Um, um, oh, thank you, Testosaurus, for that bit. Thank you for cheering. It's good that you that you're here. We can set up your computer properly as well. So that will be after the break. So we will have a short break. Um, I think this break will be birds. Yeah, Daniel's here. Welcome, Daniel. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, I didn't tell you guys, but like up here you can see something which is called the mood box. Um, I actually made a button for that as well, so let me show you. These are the commands that you can type in chat and then you will get your own little avatar there and then you can change it. Um, so I, I made this thing for Twitch, um, so I can do stuff like um, monocle and then um, I'm in the list and I have a little monocle. I just came here to ask you something about R because I have problems with the date format. What do you mean the date format? You already asked that yesterday. Like, and I was, I was confused yesterday if you meant date or data. 
<laughs> but dates are very simple, right? It's like the day minus the month minus the year. I will ask you in the evening. All right. But stay for the rest of the lecture because it's good that you get um, Git installed and make a GitHub account as well. And um, you probably have Notepad++ and R installed, so like the first 10 minutes won't be that interesting. All right, so I will stop the recording.